distorted history is, I, I would say, probably um, one of the most important books I read was a book about US history. It was called Dynamite by Lewis Adamick, and it, it talks about you know the violent class struggle of, the, of US history from kind of the Molly Maguire's right the way through to gangsterism in the 19s, 20, late 20s, and early 30s. And that book, I would say, is a good example of, try, of, of me realizing that US history was, has been very much distorted from what I've seen. I didn't realize that US history was littered with such violence, you know, and the accumulation of land, also the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the wage struggles of the late 19th century and, and the IWW and all this. I learned a lot when I was younger, 25 years ago, and I read that book. So that's, to me, an example of distorted history. We, I think, in Britain have a very distorted history about the US. So these are two things I'm looking at, hidden histories, and distorted histories. I'm not going to talk about sources, you'll have to talk to me afterwards about that. But. So if you want to go on, Rich. Okay, Peter Lewis, it's a painting, kind of, of what happened in Manchester in 1819. Okay? As you can see, it wasn't very nice. It's a big demonstration being cut down by, um, by soldiers and militia and cavalry. Um, and to put it in context, basically what was going on in Manchester, Manchester grew as a city very, very rapidly towards the end of the 18th century and into the early part of the 19th century. I think somebody was saying it was kind of quite a small town and then had 200,000 people. Now in this city, in 1819, a bit of, this is after the Napoleonic Wars, and there's radical agitation going on. The working class are made up of weavers, all sorts of other kind of wage workers and industries that are built up around Manchester and the environs of this city. And they, they were actually involved actively in a campaign uh, to fight for the vote, to get enfranchised, and there were other demands as well, obviously, formation of trade unions, all this sort of thing. So in 1819, and what I'm going to say now is kind of the narrative that most people in Britain would know about, most of the left would know about, I would argue. And the narrative goes like this. Large numbers of very organised groups of working class people around the city of Manchester planned a demonstration in 1819 where the radical orator, Henry Hunt, who's probably up here somewhere, uh, would come and speak. And Henry Hunt was, you know, sort of veteran, radical campaigner for enfranchisement and other other demands. Right? And so he was coming to speak in Manchester. All around the city, um, groups of like of workers organised themselves uh, to plan a big march to hear Henry Hunt speak and kind of demonstrate that they were very uh, uh, organised and, and reasonable <coughs> set of demands that they wanted. Okay? It was a peaceful demonstration. It was planned to be peaceful. No one was allowed to come along with any... You weren't even, normally in those days, to have a walking stick. You weren't even allowed to bring a walking stick. Okay? Only old people could have walking sticks. It was well organised. No weapons, no threat of anything. People marched in battalions, you know, together, wearing laurel leaves and flags, and everybody was decked out, and children, lots and lots of women on this demonstration. And this march comes into the centre of Manchester in 1819, and they gather around this in St Peter's Fields, this area of uh, Manchester, and they line up and, they, and the speeches start. Okay, what happens is, is that the local uh, kind of business class, I think that Steve mentioned earlier on, had formed a militia, had a militia, which is mainly made up of local businessmen, landowners, <coughs> kind of petty bourgeois, owners of big pubs and things like that. They got them together and they, they kind of decided that they were going to kind of stop this demonstration and arrest the radicals who were speaking. The militia turned up, they're on horses, they're armed, they've got sabres, whatever. Alongside them they've got a unit of the British Army um, cavalry as well. Okay? So in go the militia, into the crowd, they trot towards the front. There's a lot of jostling and trouble because the crowd's so big, it's something like 60,000 people, which you can imagine 1819 is a very, very big crowd. 60,000, probably a quarter of the population, maybe more. Um, they, enter the, they go to arrest the radical agitator Henry Hunt, and trouble breaks out. They do arrest Banworth and some of these other agitators, but it's trouble, and, and eventually fighting breaks out. Some of the crowd try and stop them doing it, but fairly peacefully, and panic breaks out in the crowd. And at that point, the militia start hacking and slaying the crowd. Um, and the British Army unit or cavalry go in to rescue the militia. And in the ensuing chaos, something like 400 people are injured, of which about 170 of them are cut, <coughs> cut with sabres. Um, the crowd scatters, lots of people are trampled. The first victim is a child who's you know, tossed out of the arms of a woman who's cut down by down by this, uh, this militia. Uh, eventually, I think there was uh, 
can't remember exactly how many deaths. It wasn't many deaths, maybe 11. And then the rest of the injuries were pretty severe. People obviously died after this and things like that. The crowds were opened up, and it is iconic in British history at the moment where the ruling classes, in a kind of evil way, cut down this crowd for no particular reason. They had reasonable demands. They were peaceful. They were organized. This wasn't a mob from Kingswood. This was like proper working class people, you know, a progressive force that was cruelly cut down at that point. Um, what happens after this is there are trials, um, the radicals are put on trial for sedition or whatever, and, and, and this moment that goes down in British history is, is kind of a turning point, I think. Um, that's the kind of narrative that most people have written about, um, about Peterloo. Um, all I'm going to do now is, before we go any further, I'm just going to read something which is very interesting. And this is uh, this is a section of this book talking about Peterloo. Um, this is a worker from a, a suburb of Manchester. I think it's a weaver speaking here, and he's talking about what went on before Peterloo happened, before this this march was organised, and what his life was like as a worker. But one of the things he says in his in his statement is this: This is going on in the trials a lot of this stuff after the trials of these radicals, right? This is, what, this is what one worker said. He said, when dusk came and we could no longer see to work, we jumped from our spinning looms and rushed to the sweet cool air of the fields or the wasteland or, or the green lane sides. We mustered, we fell into rank, we faced, marched, halted, faced about. Or in the grey of a fine Sunday morn, we would saunter through the mists, fragrant with the night odour of flowers. A police informer, who was at, this, at the trial of these radicals as well, also said this. He gave information about similar events. So what we've got here is workers leaving their, their looms, going up onto the moors near Manchester and drilling. Okay? Mustering and drilling. And this is what a police informer said. He said he's watching this. These hundreds, if not thousands, of working class people marching around. After they had done exercising, they formed a circle around their commander who told them that the intended meeting was cut off on account of their paper being illegal, but that would give them more time to drill. He then said they must have a colour and they must subscribe. Okay, so there's these figures, hundreds of workers around them, they're marching around. Thousands of people were involved in this drilling activity. Okay? usually led by old soldiers of the line. So this is demobbed British soldiers who fought in the Napoleonic Wars, organising these, these sections of the working class. Right? A consistent detail in police reports was a simulation of firing musket volleys by clapping hands. Okay? A witness statement taken by magistrates on the 10th of August described 3,000 men drilling near Middleton, which is a suburb of Manchester. And this is what an informant said. The right wing advanced first, and the words of command, fire, front rank kneeling, and when the word of command fire was given, they clapped their hands. The leader then advanced to the left wing in the same order as the right and ordered them to fire. They clapped their hands. This was repeated several times. Okay, so this is very strange. This is happening before Peterloo. We've got like 3,000, you imagine, right? I don't know what the distance around here, but we could probably multiply that by... 50 or something. But imagine if there was like 20,000 people up in Harlem marching around, drilling on, you know, on the streets or on the, on, on the parks of Harlem right, tonight. Imagine that. Imagine there was 20,000 people doing that. Right? I mean, there'd be a national emergency. Okay? This, is, this, is, this is not stuff <laughs> that's normal. This is not people sitting around in smoky reading clubs, you know, saying, oh, you know, I think we ought to have a demonstration next week. This is major, major stuff. It's a very, very strange thing to read. And suddenly the narrative is changing here. The narrative that's been put forward about this event is not, you know, is, is for a particular reason. And I would set stress that these are the following elements of the, of the normal narrative of Peterloo. Okay, the normal narrative of Peterloo is basically stresses reasonable demands, that the demonstration was organised, that it was non-violent, that you know, in fact, these people were victims of the hussars, and that you know, it really, it's a question of good and evil. The authorities are evil; they cut them down. These people are good. Okay, but this kind of this information here is some, saying some 
quite different. He'd say that actually, these people were planning an insurrection or potentially planning an insurrection. That's why they were drilling in their thousands. That's why they marched into this square in their thousands in an organized manner. Okay. And that's a sudden switch away from, you know, from, from the way I would see it from when I was growing up and when I read about it. Okay. 